Hello. Hello. Welcome to the um, New York Ghost Story Festival. This is the soft start. So we're going to give everyone a few minutes, just a couple of minutes to um, sit down, get here. We're waiting for our guest, uh, Rudy Dorneman. So we're just going to we're just going to chat for a couple of minutes. Hello to everyone in the audience. Hello to Gwendolyn and Hissop. How are you? Good. Excited to be here. Excited to be here, too. Any uh, how's uh, how's December going for everybody? <laughs> cold, right? It's always always feels cold this time of year. Okay, is a buzz. Your mic on? I can't seem to hear you. Hear me now? Ah, I hear you now. And you're <laughs> Rudy. Hey, welcome. Um, hey, welcome, Rudy. Well, glad you could join us. Um, I was just telling. Uh, telling the audience out there uh, who are ready for ghost stories that we just ran the soft start. So in about, uh, we're just gonna give other people a chance to uh, to show up and then we'll we'll run the video and we'll do the real start. How's, uh, how's everything going for you, Rudy? Pretty good. I like- uh, glitches there, but I think I'm past them. <laughs> oh yeah, I was, I was so ready to go. I'm sitting here comfortable, I got my, screens my papers my drinks and then of course like right as i'm setting the comfortable computer's like we're starting the update i'm like of course you oh are. no <laughs> of course i'm like in the kitchen trying to get a backup computer but it was a merciful it was a merciful three minute uh <laughs> and this is the real ghost story the true the true horror of the of the digital age is the the forced the forced update definitely <laughs> My computer was trying to update yesterday, and I was like, "No, you're gonna update like right now." Like, so go schedule it. And I'm like, you're gonna try to do it right in the middle of one of that one of these live events. You know, you just do it right now. And then I was scared because I only had six hours before an event. I'm like, "What if it's a six-hour update?" That used to be a thing, right? I feel like that was a big one. They're a little quicker now, but it still is always like updates. Yeah, yeah that's totally possible. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, okay. So I'm going to run the video and we'll get started. Okay, so I'm just going to mute the guest mic for a second while I start the show. Uh, we're starting the show. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the New York Ghost Story Festival. This is an annual event of ghost story readings and discussions featuring, author, featuring authors of the uncanny, the strange, and the fantastic from New York and from around the globe and from everywhere. My name is Daniel Brom. I'm the founder of the event and your host tonight. I'm an author of Strange Tales and Ghost Stories. My most recent book of them is called Underworld Dreams. And tonight is the first night of the first year of this festival. Um, I'm here with Rudy Dorneman, Hyssop Malero, and Gwendolyn Keist, who I'm gonna be introducing to you all fully in just a moment uh, after I make some opening remarks uh, for the show. So there's, um, there's a long tradition of telling ghost stories during Christmas time and during the dark days of December. And the ghost story 
as an art form has a long literary lineage and history. And over the six nights of this festival, we'll explore and visit with some of the early ghost stories and classics. Uh, the great thing is even spending all this time and all these authors, we're, we're not even gonna scratch the surface of it. And that's just fine with me. We're just gonna have a ton of fun. And that's just so great that there's so much to dive into. We're also gonna talk about some of the authors and the stories that began to change and expand uh, the ghost story form through time. And starting with tonight, we're even gonna get to hear some of the new favorites and modern stories that have been written very recently and in recent years. Uh, the full festival dates, I mentioned six nights. It's tonight is the first night. We have December 12th, December 14th, December 19th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, December 20th, which is a Sunday, we're going to do it in the afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we're going to close it up on Christmas Eve, the 24th of December at 7 p.m. For those who are looking for a ghost story or are looking for something to do on Christmas Eve. You can, uh, if you're here, please click subscribe uh, to the YouTube channel. That's a great way just to stay in touch with uh, all these events and more. Um, the festival is not for profit. It's an educational and artistic venture. We have a Ko-Fi, Ko-Fi account. Uh, that's ko-fi.com front slash nighttime logic. Uh, I'll mention that in the course of the night. If you care to donate, donations uh, will go towards our subscription, production, and advertising costs. Otherwise, this is completely free and we're happy you can be here and we hope you enjoy. Uh, the other bit that I just want to mention is I've asked all of our authors to uh, give me a name of their local or an indie bookstore. So if you hear something we're talking about and you want to look for it, uh, these are great places to check with first. And in doing so, you'll be supporting small businesses that could really use it. So let's get to the ghost stories. I'll begin with just a couple of words from author Robert Aikman. Here's a little card I got at a world fantasy once a little portrait of Robert Aikman, uh, because uh, I want to read it a couple to kick off the festival. I'm going to read just a few words from the introduction to the fourth Fontana book of great goat stories, which came out in 1971, I believe. And here's Aikman on the ghost story. Um, he says, I cannot pretend that these tales were not first called ghost stories because they were regarded as stories that dealt with the dead who returned. I should like to suggest that now the word ghost should be seen more as the German Geist, that ghost stories should be stories concerned not with appearance and consistency, but with the spirit behind appearance, the void behind the face of order. Ghost stories inquire and hint, waver and dissemble, startle and astonish. They are a last refuge from the universal affirmative shout, Robert Aikman. So uh, with that, welcome to uh, the New York Ghost Story Festival. And bear with me as I figure out how to get everyone on the screen at the same time. Hi, everybody. Hi, Rudy. Hi, Hyssop. Hi, Gwendolyn. Ah, I should turn, should I turn your mics on so we can all <laughs> hear everybody? Like, no, we really don't want to hear this writer. <laughs> no, and the power of technological mishaps. Hopefully, <laughs> we're all my X-Men powers will be muted tonight. How are you all? Good. Good. Well, doing well. Great. Um, I'll introduce everybody real quick here because we're going to be talking over the course of the night. We're going to be talking with everyone and they're going to read for you a ghost story or two that they've picked out. Rudy Dorneman is an author who lives and writes in frequently fog-trouted Portland, Maine. He writes fantastical fiction that has appeared in realms of fantasy the Spirits Unwrapped anthology, as well as many other places. Isip Molero is a speculative fiction writer obsessed with the anatomy of truth. She is originally from Manhattan, New York, and has worked forthcoming in the 2020 Visions anthology. And Gwendolyn Keist is the award-winning author of The Rust Maidens, The Invention of Ghosts, Bone Set and Feathers and Others, 
She was a Nighttime Logic guest in 2018, and I'm very pleased to have her back here tonight. Is uh, everyone ready for some ghost stories? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. First up is Rudy Dorneman. Rudy Dorneman lives in frequently fog-shrouded Portland, Maine. His short fiction has appeared in such places as Strange Horizons, Realms of Fantasy, and the anthology Spirits Unwrapped. He instigated and contributed to flash fiction website The Daily Cabal and was the second season host of the YYY, The Books Podcast. His set of six micro fictions, Invisible Edge Cities, Calvino Remixes, was included in a gallery exhibition of constraint based art at Northern Ohio University. And he could be found online at www.rudydorneman.com. Hey, Rudy. Hey. I'm going to just try to get you and I on the screen here at the same time. I'm playing around with this. So, um, doesn't seem to be working, but uh, oh nope. Hey, Gwendolyn. <laughs> hey, everybody. Thanks for uh, thanks for bearing with me. So, Rudy, you've been um, you've been published in Realms of Fantasy, in the Fortean Bureau, and the Daily Cabal, and many other places. I'm a longtime reader of your stories. If you could tell someone who's just learning about you uh, an introduction. To some of your fiction and what it's about. Um, let's see, I guess my stories tend to um, try to take you to um, an imaginary place um, and to put you in the experience of somebody who's living there and um, hopefully give you some kind of experience that you, you wouldn't get in the ordinary world. And when you're saying ordinary world, um, you're talking about you're talking about our world here, or the ordinary world of the story. Uh, more our world here, I guess. Um, well, you know, it's not a secret that you're one um, you're one of my favorite authors, and that's why I asked you to open up the festival. Um, Rudy's also a friend of mine and a valued colleague. Uh, he wrote the introduction to one of my chat books, and I had the opportunity to publish one of his stories called Fog Marsh in a uh, Lev, Pre Lev Press anthology called Spirits Unwrapped. What I like about uh, readers out there, what I like about Rudy's stories is a lot of his protagonists have a sense um, of innocence, and like there's a very quiet aspect to some of his protagonists, yet this is juxtaposed against a lot of insidious dangers that are lurking just out of sight and um, just out of reach. So Rudy, just before we talk about some of your favorite ghost stories, what is it that for you that makes um, that makes a ghost story form so fun and enduring? Um, I think there's a few different things, but uh, one of them is um, it kind of, it puts sort of two different, it can, you know, it can put two different times in history together um, and have them kind of bump up against each other. Um, there's often a, a kind of interesting um, thing going on where someone's trying to figure out what's going on. Um, there's often a sense of danger, so there's a little extra tension there. Um, sometimes, um, like the story I'm going to read, um, you know it's a ghost story when you're reading it, but it doesn't always seem like a ghost story. So you're kind of waiting around, like, okay, when's when's the spooky part coming? Um, so it's got that kind of expectation set up that's kind of fun, to work with, whether you're reading it or not. You mentioned the stories um, before we get to the stories that the story that you're going to read from in advance. I asked you about a couple of your favorite ghost stories and one of them that you mentioned to me was the empty house by algernon blackwood um oh maybe i've got that maybe i've got that oh, wrong that, that is it yeah yeah I'm, okay i was wrong about it being wrong 
<laughs> okay. Okay. But that is by, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, that's the one by, uh, if I'm going to pronounce, use my power to mispronounce by, uh, is it Saki, uh, which is the pen name of uh, the British author, H.H. Author H. Munro? Oh, yeah, that's the, the open window. Yeah, sorry for the mix up. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, well, it was a great bunch. I'm, I'm a little bit confused because I have so many ghost stories on my brain. But um, the and the third story I believe that you mentioned, you mentioned some Bradbury. Uh, was it There Will Come Soft Rains, but from the Martian Chronicles? Yeah. And which is a great a great bunch to start the festival off with. Um, some classic ghost stories. I'm gonna hold off on the Bradbury because I think we're gonna talk a little bit about Bradbury a little later on. But um, the Empty House by Blackwood. Um, like Blackwood's classic weird fiction story, The Willows. This one features two adventures. Uh, one of them, if I'm not mistaken, is Jim Shorthouse, Algernon Blackwood's ghost hunting investigator. And an interesting fact I learned when checking out this story was that it's based on Blackwood's real life. Uh, in addition to writing, he was um, he was an investigator of haunted houses, a forerunner, kind of a big forerunner to today's ghost hunters. And what struck me about this story as an addition to the Willows is it's less about being tightly plotted and more about atmosphere, more about the responses of the characters. And both of these things are on the top of the list of why, uh, what I'm after as a uh, reader and as a writer. So my next question to you is, what's the importance to you of atmosphere and character uh, character response in a ghost story and um, how does that play out for you in The Empty House by Black? Um, yeah, well, I think the um, I think the setting and you know the atmosphere and everything often contributes a lot to a ghost story um, and The Empty House, like you might figure out from the title, is definitely a haunted house story, so um, it's the it's it's that house, it's night, it's getting later and later. Um, and, and Blackwood really, um, does a lot with, um, the characters, you know, listening for every little sound and, and, and waiting to see what's going to happen. Um, and so I think it really does that really well. And, um, uh, well, after you asked me to, to participate, I, kind of had to go on a little crash course of ghost stories where I'm like, hmm, do I really know ghost stories well enough to make a good choice? Mm -hmm. um, and I read a lot of them that were kind of low-key. Um, and The Empty House definitely isn't one of those. Um, it like almost tells you right from the start that the house is definitely haunted. Um, or it's certainly hinting strongly that way. And, you know, things are happening pretty fast in the story things that another story might have saved up for the climax, um, you getting halfway in and it just goes up from there. So um so the way he uses um the atmosphere and the way the characters are reacting and waiting and trying to anticipate what might happen or what they'll do. Um yeah, he, even though he's he's getting pretty spooky pretty fast. Um, he's able to keep that tension going in the back and forth between the characters and the, and the atmosphere to just take it up higher and higher as it goes. The other story you mentioned, um, when you, you're talking about getting to it and, and character reaction and tension, uh, The Open Window by H.H. H. Monroe um, is is one that I was thinking about it as you were even describing the Blackwood because uh, the story ultimately turns out not to be a supernatural story but a story that has a twist ending. The main character and we, the reader, are fooled in a way. We're fooled and um, thinking about the story. I think about a lot of like modern television or the modern world with. Um, uh, there's a lot of hoaxes or ghost hunters and things for, for TV or for fame or for fortune. And I think about the television with um, the water cooler moments of like, oh, this big, this big twist. So what, it, what is the importance of this tension 
in the ghost story between is it real and isn't supernatural to you in ghost story fiction? Is it is it important to you? Is it not important at all? Is it um, somewhere in between? And and why did you pick this one by H. H. Monroe? Um, let's see. Well, um, I think I'm maybe a little less interested in the is it real, isn't it thing because most of the time in ghost stories, you're as a reader, you're going to lean towards oh, it probably is real. Um, unless there's a big twist coming. Um, and I think one of the things that's interesting to see how different ghost stories do it is, um, particularly if it's a first person story, a lot of times the narrator goes out of their way to say, um, this really happened. I know you won't believe me, but really it did. And you know, here's why you should believe me. Um, so to some extent, it's almost more interesting to see how the the characters try to figure out whether it's real or not, what they're doing to try and reassure themselves um, that what they're seeing isn't really what they think they're seeing. Um, and one of the things I really like about um, The Open Window um, is, um, like you said, there's a twist and it all gets kind of reframed at the end. Um, but while you're in the middle of it and you're getting the story of what's supposedly happening with the haunting, um, it felt like it was really kind of checking all the, the, um, the really classic ghost story boxes, um, as it's setting things up. Um, and maybe that's part of the reason that it's working in the story as a hoax that's fooling someone is that it's like such a, um, really nice classic ghost story setting. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I I love that whether it whether it's classic or to to uh, whether it's modern, like even even stories that are going to give me a twist or even stories that are going to subvert it, I love it when we're playing within the box of the classic setup. Um, I always mention the films The Witch and It Follows. While they're not necessarily ghost stories, they're stories that structurally they do that for me. They're setting up the classic boxes and then the story can stray can stray from it um before you're going to read a ghost story for us but before you read um is there a local bookstore um you can mention where listeners can check out some of the books we're talking about uh yes yeah i wanted to give a shout out um to the green hand bookstore um and they've got swag and stickers so i think you can give you a little visual Ooh. but uh yeah definitely um a good used bookstore anyway, but if you're interested in um, any kind of speculative fi fiction, but particularly tending in the horror direction, um, the physiology, things like that, um, they're real specialties of, of Leona and Michelle. Um, and in fact, um, I was picking her brain for like advice on, on coming up with a ghost story. So she was, yeah, I definitely it. second. I definitely second the green hand. I've I've never physically been in the store, but during COVID, uh, Michelle and the green hand has been my go-to bookstore shopping. Um, you know, if it's weird fiction, if it's if it's speculative fiction, if it's cryptozoology, Michelle will help you out. And uh, a great thing if you don't know what to get someone for the holidays, I've been getting people these mystery gifts where you just be like, hey, Rudy likes. Uh, dragons and ghost stories and cryptids get them a mystery stack so that's like a great you know, they, she handles the mail order really well so uh and all the in the time of covid all these small businesses can use our support so we could uh you know that's one one to consider so you're going to be reading now rudy from man sized in marble by e nesbitt why was this your pick for tonight um let's see well this one seemed like a very good, solid, kind of classic ghost story, but it also has, um, it's got kind of a fun narrator voice. You can, he's a little annoying, but, you know, he also kind of wins you over. Um, um, there's some really nice, uh, you know, I'm a sucker for a good, like, lyrical description of a countryside. Um, mm. And there's, there's definitely some in there. Um, not overdone, but it's, it's kind of woven in and it's kind of fun to see how 
um, the landscape that's involved um, that's that the characters like so much early on gradually becomes a little more sinister. All right, I'm going to turn the screen over to Rudy, who will um, and just say the end when you're done. You're going to be reading the whole story or parts of it, Rudy? Um, let's see. I was going to shoot for the whole story, but I don't know if I'm if I'm running short on time at all. Okay, okay. Um, I'll chime in uh, around the half hour mark if we're not. Um, we'll see how that goes. If you're done before that, just say and and. We'll wrap it up. So we're turning the screen over to Rudy Dornerman reading Man Sized in Marble. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm actually reading this from um, Edward Gorey's collection of ghost stories, Gorey's Haunted Looking Glass, which means there's an Edward Gorey illustration for every story. So this is Man Sized in Marble by E. Nesbitt. Although every word of this story is as true as despair, I do not expect people to believe it. Nowadays, a rational explanation is required before belief is possible. Let me then at once offer the rational explanation, which finds most favor among those who have heard the tale of my life's tragedy. It is held that we were under a delusion. Laura and I, on that 31st of October, and that this supposition places the whole matter on a satisfactory and believable basis. The reader can judge when he too has heard my story how far this is an explanation, and in what sense it is rational. There were three who took part in this, Laura and I and another man. The other man still lives and can speak to the truth of the least credible part of my story. I never in my life knew what it was to have as much money as I required to supply the most ordinary needs, good colors, books, and cab fares. And when we were married, we knew quite well that we should only be able to live it all by strict punctuality and attention to business, as they say. I used to paint in those days, and Laura used to write, and we felt sure that we could keep the pot at least simmering. Living in town was out of the question. So we went to look for a cottage in the country, which should be at once sanitary and picturesque. So rarely do these two qualities meet in one cottage that our search was for some time quite fruitless. We tried advertisements, but most of the desirable rural residences which, did, which we did look at proved to be lacking in both essentials, and when a cottage chanced to have drains. It also had stucco as well, and was shaped like a tea caddy. And if we find a, found a vine or rose-covered porch, corruption invariably lurked within. Our minds got so befogged by the eloquence of house agents and the rival disadvantages of the fever traps and outrages to beauty that which we had seen and scorned, that I very much doubt whether either of us on our wedding morning knew the difference between a house and a haystack. But when we got away from friends and house agents on our honeymoon, our wits grew clear again, and we knew a pretty cottage when at last we saw it. It was at Brenzet, a little village set on a hill over against the southern marshes. We had gone there from the seaside village where we were staying to see the church, and two fields from the church we found this cottage. It stood quite by itself, about two miles from the village. It was a long, low building, with rooms sticking out in unexpected places. There was a bit of stonework, ivy covered and moss grown, just two old rooms, all that was left of a big house that had once stood there, and round this stonework the house had been. Stripped of its roses and jasmine, it would have been hideous. As it stood, it was charming, and after brief examination, we took it. It was absurdly cheap. The rest of our honeymoon we spent in grubbing about in second-hand shops in the country town, picking up bits of old oak and Chippendale chairs for our furnishing. We wound up with a run up to town and a visit to Liberty's, and soon the low, oak-themed, lattice-windowed rooms began to be home. There was a jolly, old-fashioned garden, 
with grass paths and no end of hollyhocks and sunflowers and big lilies. From the window, you could see the marsh pastures and beyond them the blue, thin line of the sea. We were as happy as the summer was glorious and settled down into work sooner than we expected, sooner than we ourselves expected. I was never tired of sketching the view and the wonderful cloud effects from the open lattice, and Laura would sit at the table and write verses about them, in which I mostly played the part of foreground. We got a tall old peasant woman to do for us. Her face and figure were good, though her cooking was of the homeless. But she understood all about gardening and told us all the old names of the coppices and cornfields, and the stories of the smugglers and highwaymen, and better still, of the things that walked, and of the sights which met one in lonely glens of a starlit night. She was a great comfort to us, because Laura hated housekeeping as much as I loved folklore, and soon we came to leave all the domestic business to Mrs. Dorman, and to use her legends and little magazine stories, which brought in the jingling giddy. We had three months of married happiness, and I did not have a sing and did not have a single quarrel. One October evening I had been down to smoke a pipe with the doctor, her only neighbor, a pleasant young Irishman. Laura had stayed at home to finish a comic sketch of a village episode for the monthly Marquette. I left her laughing over her own jokes and came in to find her a crumpled heap of pale muslin weeping in the window seat. Good heavens, my darling, what's the matter? I cried, taking her in my arms. She leaned her little dark head against my shoulder and let her cry. I had never seen her cry before. We had always been so happy to see and I felt sure that some frightful misfortune had happened. What is the matter? Do speak. It's Mrs. It's Mrs. Dorman, she sobbed. What has she done? I inquired, and then stood again. She says she must go before the end of the month, and she says her niece is ill. She's gone down to see her now, but I don't believe that's the reason, because her niece is always ill. I believe someone has been setting her against us. Her manner was, was so queer. Never mind, Percy, I said. Whatever you do, don't cry, or I shall have to cry to you and to keep you in countenance, and, and then you'll never respect your man again. She dried her eyes obediently on my handkerchief and even smiled faintly. But you see, she went on, it, it really is serious, because these village people are so sheep that if one won't do a thing, you can be quite sure none of the others will. And I shall have to cook the dinners and wash up the hateful greasy plates, and you'll have to carry cans of water about and clean the boots and knives, and we shall never have any time for work or earn any money or anything. We shall have to work all day and only be able to rest when we are waiting for the kettle to work. I represented to her that even if we had to perform these duties, the day would still present some margin for other toils and occupations. But she refused to see the matter in any but the greatest light. She was very unreasonable, my Laura, but I could not have loved her any more if she had been as reasonable as possible. I'll speak to Mrs. Dorman when she comes back and see if I can't come to terms with her, I said. Perhaps she wants a rise in her pay. It will be all right. Let's walk up to the church. The church was a large and lovely and lonely place and we loved to go there, especially upon bright nights. The path skirted a wood cut through, it, cut through it once and ran along the crest of a hill through two meadows and round the churchyard wall, over which two old yews loomed in black masses of shadow. This path, which was partly paved, was called the beer walk, for it had long been the way by which the corpses had been carried to the The churchyard was richly treed, and was shaded by great elms, which stood just outside and stretched their majestic arms in benediction over the happy day. A large, low porch let one into the building by a morning door, and a heavy door studded with iron. Inside, the arches rose into darkness, and between them were articulated windows, which stood out white in the moonlight. In the chancel, the windows were rich glass, which showed in faint light their noble colors and made the black oak of the choir pews hardly more solid than shadows. 
but on each side of the altar lay a gray marble figure of a knight in a full plate armor lying upon a low slab with hands held up in everlasting prayer. And these figures, oddly enough, were always to be seen if there was any glimmer of light in the church. Their names were lost, but the peasants told of them that they had been fierce and wicked men, marauders by land and sea, who had been the scourge of their time, and had been guilty of deeds so foul that the house they lived in, the big house, by the way, that had stood on the side of the cottage, had been stricken by lightning in the vengeance of heaven. But for all that, the gold of their heirs had bought them a place in the church. Looking at the bad, hard faces reproduced in the marble, the story was easily believed. The church looked at its best and weirdest on that night, for the shadows of the yew trees fell through the windows upon the floor of the nave and touched the pillars with tattered shade. We sat down together without speaking and watched the solemn beauty of the old church, with some of that awe which had inspired its certain buildings. We walked to the chancel and looked at the sleeping walls. Then we rested some time in the stone seat on the porch, looking out over the stretch of quiet moonlit meadows, feeling in every fiber of our dreams the peace of the night and of our happy life, and came away at last with a sense that even scrubbing and black rubbing were but small troubles at their worst. Mrs. Dorman had come back from the village, and I at once invited her to a tete a Now, Mrs. Dorman, I said, when I had got her into the paint room, what's all this about your not staying with us? I should be glad to get away, sir, before the end of the month, she answered with her usual placid dignity. Have you any fault to find, Mrs. Dorman? Not at all, sir. You and your lady have always been most kind, I'm sure. Well, what is it? Are your wages not high enough? No, sir, I can sweat enough. Then why not stay? I'd rather not, with some hesitation. My niece is ill. But your niece has been ill ever since we came. No answer. There was a long and awkward silence. I broke it. Can't you stay for another month, I asked? No, sir, I'm bound to go by Thursday. And this was Monday. Well, I must say, I think you might have let us know before. There's no time now for to get anyone else, and your mistress is not fit to be driven elsewhere. Can't you stay till next week? I might be able to come back next week. I was now convinced that all she wanted was a big holiday, which we would have been willing enough to let her have as, as soon as we could get a substitute. But why not must you go, why must you go this week? I persisted. Come out with us. Mrs. Dorman drew a little shawl, which she always wore, tightly across her bosom, as though she were cold. Then she said with a sort of effort, They say, sir, as this was a big house in capital times, and there was a many deeds done with you there. The nature of the deeds might be vaguely inferred from the inflection of Mrs. Dorman's voice, which was enough to make one's blood run cold. I was glad that Laura was not in the room. She was always nervous, as highly strong natures are, and I felt that these tales about our house, told by the old, this old peasant woman, with her impressive manner and contagious credulity, might have made our home less dear to my wife. Tell me all about it, Mrs. Dorman, I said. You needn't mind about telling me. I'm not like the young people who make fun of such things. It was hard to Well, sir, she said. You may have seen in the church, beside the altar, two shapes. You mean the effigies of knights in armor, I said cheerfully. I mean them two bodies, drawn out, man-sized, in marble, she returned. And I have to admit her description was a thousand times more graphic than mine, to say nothing of a certain weird force and uncanniness about the phrase, drawn out, man-sized, in marble. The you say, as on all saints eaves, them two bodies sits up on their slabs, and gets off with them, and then walks down the aisle, eating their marble. And the big hairs must have been. And as the church clock strikes eleven, they walk out of the church door, and over the graves, and along the beer walk, and if it's a wet night, there's marks of their feet in the morning. And where do they go? I asked, fascinated. 
they come back here to their home soon. And if anyone meets them, well, what then? I asked. But no, not another word could I get from her, save that her niece was ill and she must be. After what I had heard, I scorned to discuss the niece and tried to get from Mrs. Warren more details of the legend. I could get nothing but warnings. But every you do, sir, lock the door early on All Saints' Eve and make the sign of the cross over the doorstep and on the windows. Has anyone ever seen these things? I persisted. That's not for me to say. I know what I know, sir. Well, who was here last year? No one, sir. The lady has owned the house. Only stayed here in summer, and she only went to London a whole month or four of the nights. And I'm sorry to inconvenience you and your lady, but my niece is ill, and I must go on Thursday. I have shaken her for her absurd reiteration of that obvious fiction after she told me, told me her real reasons. She was determined to go, nor could our united entreaties move her in the least. I did not tell more of the legend of the shapes that walked in their marble. Partly because a legend concerning a house might perhaps trouble my mind, and partly, I think, some more occult reason. This was not quite the same to me as any other story, and I did not want to talk about it till the day was over. I had very soon ceased to think of the legend, however. I was painting a portrait of Laura against the lattice window, and I could not think of much else. I had got a splendid background of yellow and gray sunset, and was working away with enthusiasm at the face. Thursday, Mrs. Dorman went. She relented at parting so far as to say, Don't you put yourself about too much, Mary. And if there's any little thing I can do next week, I'm sure I, sh sure I shan't mind. Which I, from which I inferred that she wished to come back to us after talking. Up to the last, she adhered to the fiction of the niece with touching fidelity. Thursday passed pretty well. Laura showed marked ability in the matter of steak and potatoes, and I confess that my knives and the plates, which I insisted upon washing, were better done than I had dared to expect. Friday came. It was about what happened that Friday that this is written. I wonder if I should have believed it if anyone had told it to me. I will write the story of it as quickly and plainly as I can. Everything that happened on that day was burnt into my memory. I shall not forget anything, nor leave anything out. I got up early, I remember, and lighted the kitchen fire. I had just achieved a smoky success when my little wife came running down as sunny and sweet as the clear October morning itself. We prepared breakfast together and found it very good fun. The housework was soon done, and when brushes and brooms and pails were quiet again, the house was still in view. It is wonderful what a difference one makes in the house. We really miss Mrs. Dorman, quite apart from considerations concerning the life to the we spent the day investing our books in Italy straight and dined gaily on cold steak and coffee. Laura was, if possible, brighter and gayer and sweeter than usual, and I began to think that a little domestic, that a little domestic tour was really good for me. We had never been so merry since we were married, and the walk we had that afternoon was, I think, the happiest time of our life. When we had watched the deep scarlet clouds slowly pale into leaden gray against the pale green sky, and saw the white mist curl up along the hedgerows in the distant marsh, and came back to the house, silently, hand in hand. You are sad, my darling, I said half jestingly, as we sat down together in our little garden. I expected a disclaimer, for once, for my own silence had been the silence of complete happiness. To my surprise, she said, Yes, I think I am sad, or rather, I am an uneasy. I don't think I am very well. I have shivered three or four times since we came in, and it is not cold, is it? No, I said, and hoped it was not a chill caught from the treacherous mist that rolled up from the marshes of the dying night. No, she said she did not think so. Then, after a silence, she spoke suddenly. Do you ever have presentiments of evil? No, I said, smiling, and I shouldn't believe in them if I had. I do, she went on. The night my father died, I knew it, though he was right away in the north of Scotland. I, I, I did not answer in words. She sat looking at the fire for some time in silence, gently stroking her hand. 
At last, she sprang up, came behind me, and drawn my head back and kissed me. There, it's over now, she said. What, what a baby I am. Come, light the candles, and we'll have some of the new Rubenstein duets. And we spent a happy hour or two at the pool. About half past ten, I began to long for the good night pipe, and Laura looked so white that I felt it would be brutal of me to fill our sitting room with the fumes of strong cabbage. I'll take my pipe outside, I said. Let me come too. No, sweetheart, not tonight. You're much too tired. I shan't be long. Get to bed, or I shall have an invalid's nurse tomorrow as well as boots to clean. I kissed her and was turning to go. When she flung her arms round my neck and held me as if she never would never let me go again. I stroked her hair. Come, Pussy, you're overtired. The housework has been too much for you. She loosened her clasp a little and drew it in front. No, we've been very happy to tell you. Haven't we? Don't stay out too long. I won't be. I strolled out of the front door, leaving it unlatched. What a night it was! The jagged masses of heavy dark cloud were rolling at intervals from horizon to horizon, and thin white wreaths covered the stars. Through, the, through all the rush of the cloud river, the moon swam, resting the waves and disappearing upon the darkness. When now and again her light reached the woodlands, they seemed to be slowly and noiselessly waving in time to the swing of the clouds above them. There was a strange gray light over all the earth. The fields had that shadowy bloom over them which only comes in marriage of dew and moonshine, or frost and stars. I walked up and down, looking at the beauty of the quiet earth and the changing sky. The night was absolutely silent. Nothing seemed to be above. There was no stirring of rabbits, no twitter of half-asleep half birds. And though the clouds went sailing across the sky, the wind that drove them never came low enough to rustle the dead leaves and the ripping grass. Across the meadows I could see a church tower standing out black and gray against the sky. I walked there, thinking over our fields of happiness, and of my wife, her dear eyes, her loving eyes. Oh, my little girl, my own little girl, what a vision came then of a long, glad light with you and me together. I heard a bell beat from the church. Eleven already? I turned to go in, but the night held me. I could not go back into our warm little rooms yet. I would go up to the church. I felt vaguely that it would be good to carry my love and thankfulness to the sanctuary, whither so many loads of sorrow and gladness had been borne by the men and women of the dead years. I looked in at the window as I went by. Laura was half lying up in, on a chair in front of the fire. I could not see her face, only her little head showed against the pale blue wall. She was quite still, asleep for the night. My heart reached out to her and I There must be a God in that, and a God who was good. How otherwise could anything so sweet and dear as she have ever been imagined? If I'm running out of time, that might be a good place to stop. What's that? How are you doing on time? Yeah. Um, how much longer do you have to go to the end? Uh, we've got another good six pages or so. Let's, how, we got to hear the end of it. So you want to keep on going? Let's, let's, let's do it. Okay. okay. I walked slowly along the edge of the wood. Sound broke the stillness of the night. It was a rustling in the wood. I stopped and listened. The sound stopped too. I went on and now distinctly heard another step from mine, answering mine like an echo. It was a poacher or wood stealer, most likely, for those were not unknown in our Arcadian neighborhood. But whoever it was, he was a fool not to step more lightly. I turned into the wood, and now the footsteps seemed to come from the path I had just left. It must be an echo. The wood looked perfect in the moon. The large dying ferns and the brushwood showed where, where through thinning foliage the pale light came down. The tree trunks stood up like gothic columns all around me. They reminded me of the church, and I turned into a beer lot 
and pass through the corpse gate between the gate and, and between the graves up to the low porch. I paused for a moment on the stone seat where Laura and I had watched the fading landscape. Then I noticed that the door of the church was open, and I blamed myself for having it left, un left it unlatched the other night. We were the only people who ever dared to come to the church except on Sundays, and I was vexed to think that through our carelessness, the damp autumn airs had a chance of getting in and injuring the old fabric. I went in. It would seem strange, perhaps, that I should have gone halfway up the aisle before I remembered, with a sudden chill followed by a sudden rush of self-contempt, that this was the very day and hour when, according to tradition, the Shapes brought out man size and marble began to walk. Having thus remembered the legend, and remembered it with a shiver, of which I was shame, I could not do otherwise than to walk up towards the altar just to look at the figures, as I said to myself. Really what I wanted was to assure myself, first, that I did not believe the legend, and secondly, that it was not true. And I was rather, I was rather glad that it would come. I thought now I could tell Mrs. Lane how vain the fancies were and how peacefully the marble figures slept on through the ghostly hour. With my hands in my pockets, I passed up the aisle. In the gray dim light, the eastern end of the church looked larger than the church, and the arches above the two tombs looked larger too. The moon came out and showed me the reason. I stopped short, my heart gave a leap that nearly choked me, and then sank suddenly. The body is drawn out man-size. They're gone. And their marble slabs lay wide and bare in the vague moonlight that slanted through the east wind. Were they really gone, or was I mad? Clenching my nerves, I stooped and passed my hand over the smooth slabs and felt their flat, unbroken surface. Had someone taken the thing to win? Was it some vile practical joke? I would make sure anyway. In an instant, I had made a torch of the newspaper which happened in my pocket and lighted it held it high above my head. Its yellow glare illuminated the dark arches and low slabs. The figures were gone, and I was alone in the church. Or was I alone? And then a horror seized me, a horror indefinable and indescribable, an overwhelming certainty of supreme and accomplished calamity. I flung down the church and tore along the aisle and out through the porch, biting my lips as I ran to keep from shrieking aloud. Oh, was I mad? What was this that possessed me? I leaped the churchyard wall and took a straight cut across the field, led by the light from our windows. Just as I got over the first stile, a dark figure seemed to spring out of the ground. Mad still with that certainty of misfortune, I made the thing that stood in my path, shouting, Get out of my way, can't you? But my push met with a more vigorous resistance than I had expected. My arms were caught just above the elbow and held as in a vice. And the paw boned Irish doctor actually shook, shook me. What ye? he cried in his own unmistakable accents. What ye then? Let me go, you fool, I guess. The marble figures have gone from the church. I tell you, they're gone. He broke into a little laugh. I'll have to give you a draft tomorrow, I see. You've been smoking a bit too much and listening to old wives' tale. I tell you, I've seen the bare slabs. Well, come back with me. I'm going up to Old Palmer's, his daughter's home. We'll look in at the church and let me see the bare, bare stalls. You go if you like, I said. A little less frantic for his laughter. But I'm going home to my wife. Rubbish, man, said he. Do you think I'll permit that? Are you to go saying all your life that you've seen solid marble endowed with vitality, and me to go all my life saying you were, you were a coward? No, sir. You shan't do it. The night air, human voice, and I think also the physical contact with this six feet of solid common sense, all brought me back to a little of my ordinary self, and the word coward was a little shock. Come on then, I said suddenly. Perhaps you're right. He still held my arm tightly. We got over the stile and back to the church. All was still as death. The place smelt very damp and empty. I walked up the aisle. I am not ashamed to confess that I shut my eyes. I knew the figures would not be there. I heard Kelly strike a match. Here they are, you see, right enough. You've been dreaming or drinking. Asking your pardon for the imputation. I opened my eyes. 
by Kelly's expiring vest up Michelle saw two shapes lying in their marble on the slabs. I drew a deep breath and caught his hand. I'm awfully indebted to you, I said. It must have been some trick of light, or I've been, I have been working that hard. Perhaps that's it. Do you know, I was quite convinced they were gone. I'm aware of that, he answered rather grimly. You'll have to be careful of that brain of yours, my friend, I assure you. He was leaning over and looking at the right-hand figure, whose stony face was the more villainous and deadly expression. By Jove, he said, something has been afoot here. This hand is broken. And so it was. I was certain that it had been perfect the last time Laura and I had been here. Perhaps someone has tried to remove them, said the man. That won't account for my impression, he rejected. Too much painting and tobacco will account for that, will it? Come along, I said, or my wife will be getting anxious. We'll come in and have a drop of whiskey and drink confusion to ghosts and have and drink better sense to me. I ought to go up to Palmer's, but it's so late now, I'd best leave it till the morning. I was kept late at the Union, and I've had to see a lot of people since. All right, I'll come back again. I think he fancied I needed him more than did Palmer's work. So, discussing how such an illusion could have been possible, and deducing from his experience large generalities concerning ghostly apparitions, we walked up to our cottage. We saw, as we walked up the garden path, that bright light streamed out of the front door. Presently, and presently saw that the parlor door was open too. Had she gone out? Come in, I said, and Dr. Kelly followed me into the parlor. It was all ablaze with candles, not only the wax ones, but at least a dozen guttering yellow tallow dips, stuck in vases and ornaments in, in, un, in unlikely places. Light, I knew, was Laura's remedy for nervousness. Poor oh, child, why had I left you? Was. We glanced around the room, and at first we did not see them. The window was open, and the draft set all the candles flaring in it. Her chair was empty, and her handkerchief and book lay on the floor. I turned to the window. There, in the recess of the window, I saw her. Oh, my child, my love, had she gone to that window to watch for me? And what had come into the room behind her? To what had she turned with that look of frantic fear and horror? Oh, my little one, had she thought that it was I whose step she heard and turned to me? What? She had fallen back across the table in the window, and her body lay half on it and half on the window sill, and her head hung down over the table, and the brown hair loosened and fallen to the carpet. Her lips were drawn back, and her eyes wide, wide open. They saw nothing now. What had they seen next? The doctor moved towards her, but I pushed him aside and sprang to her, caught her in my arms and cried, It's all right, Laura, I've got you safe, wifey. She fell into my arms and fell. I clasped her, kissed her, and called her by all her pet names, but I think I knew all the time that she was dead. Her hands were tightly clenched. In one of them she held something fast. When I was quite sure that she was dead, and that nothing mattered at all, I let him open her hand to see what she held. It was a gray marble thing. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. That was Rudy Dorneman reading Man Sized in Marble by E. Nesbitt. Just working with the controls here. Let's see. Next up, our next reader is Hyssop Molero. How are you doing, Hyssop? Hey, doing well, doing well. Hyssop Molero is a speculative fiction writer that revels in subverting ethics, morality, and that strange notion called truth. Originally from Manhattan, New York, Hyssop now calls South Georgia home, where she frequently hikes the backcountry, listens to horror scores, and tinkers in taxidermy. Hyssop's also part of the uh, team of the Outer Dark, and I had the opportunity to hear her read 
uh, was it already last year at uh, Necronomicon Providence? Um, so my first question over to you, Hisop, is um, a weird fiction question. Why do ghost stories seem to lend themselves and work so well together with weird fiction? Hmm. Um, well, they kind of, I think they both lend themselves to like this abstract, uh, abstract thought, things that um, one can't necessarily prove. And likewise, if you can, it kind of brings you to um, a place that humans tend to not be comfortable. And that, you know, that goes for ghost stories, for ghosts, and for weird fiction. It kind of leaves you, I think, as you said, Aikman said earlier, in this void. And <laughs> a lot of people are uncomfortable being in that void. Um, so they pretty much go hand in hand. <laughs> the void. Robert Aikman, yeah, ghost stories, and the void. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, they one of the stories you nicely. were telling me about in advance as we were preparing for this um, is a story called um, Fantasy Most Grotesque by the author Felicity Dowker. And, uh, right, like talking, talking about a story that might make you uncomfortable. I mean, that has a lot of carnival imagery in it. And because of that, it's been compared to the work of Ray Bradbury. But the story also, what I what draw, what struck me about the story is it also plays with that tension that Rudy and I were talking about between are these things happening in characters' heads or are they supernatural? So my next question for you is, what is the appeal in the ghost story of this ambiguity and the ambiguous elements that so often come into play? Um, I mean, merely for the fact that, you know, we're not sure if they're there. Um, and that kind of interests us. We can't help be interested in things that, or situations uh, that we necessarily, that aren't concrete, um, that lend itself to like that imaginary world, or if not imaginary, something that we're not used to. Um, it's, it, it's whether most want to uh, admit it or not, it is. It does have its appeal. F fairly dangerous, but an appeal nonetheless. Um, that is needs to be explored. <laughs> like we all want to explore it in some way, um, safely. Uh, but if not, you know, it needs to be explored either way. It's yeah. I think that's a cool answer. I mean, I um, I often try to think of word, like think of terms and name names for these things, and I think you are. You were summing up a lot better than I've done. What I, what I, I tend to call that in the horror story, the ghost story. There's also, I tend to call it the sense of wonder. And, you know, and you're saying, yeah, it's a, there's something appealing about it. And we just want to explore it and know it. And I think that that, um, that was, you know, really, really sums up that how I feel about the ghost story, too. Um, before you get to reading, I just want to ask, yeah. are there any... Uh, local bookstores in South Georgia or otherwise that you want to give us a heads up on? Uh, I can't say I've visited many. Um, <laughs> I've I've been here for perhaps maybe two years now, but I can't. Um, what I can recommend is Eagle Eye Bookshop. I can say I've frequented that uh, quite a few times. Did a few heard a few readings. Okay. Um, met up with the Outer Dark there, okay. and they have a really good selection. Is that the one that's in so, Atlanta? And that's indicator. Okay. Okay. I think I think I yeah. was there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Maybe for the first Outer Dark, I forgot the name, but if that's the one that they do their readings at, that was um, that, that's a cool one. All right, yeah, yeah in Atlanta. It's so you um, well, you're about to read. Um, I'm excited because you selected a story that I hadn't heard of before. So, uh, in fact, it's pretty new. It came out in 2020 in a book uh, called "It Calls from the Forest," Volume Two, and you're going to be reading from "Between the Trees" by yeah. Dustin Walker. Um. Before you read, can you tell us a bit about what drew you to this story and made it your choice? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so forest stories are, I love them. I love the woods, as, as you know, you mentioned not too long ago. Um, when you pair forests with ghosts, I'm just all in. And this particular story, 
Um, actually, what made me choose it was <laughs> the audacity of the writer. As, and maybe you'll, you know, the audience and everyone will experience this as well, as uh, I was reading it, it kind of has this um, mellow, uh, simplistic vibe, and you're not, you're not too quite sure where he's going, or, you, or at the least, I'm not sure if I want to know where he's going, but I said, I'm going to finish the story. And at the end, it has a nice little punch to it. Not super strong as if like a rug's being pulled out from under you, but maybe a tablecloth. Like if one pulls a tablecloth and all the plates stay still. And I think just because I wasn't expecting it throughout reading the story, I thought he was worthy of a read. I said, okay, uh, you know, between the trees, this, cool. this is a good I'm pick I'm excited right for it. So, so. here's the uh, Bolero yeah. reading Between the Trees by Dustin Walker. All righty. I notice the dark clouds just as I'm parking the car. I don't know, kiddo, it's gonna rain pretty quick here. I say, glancing at my daughter Paige in the back seat. She clutches a bright pink Fisher Price camera, the same color as her fingernails. Really, dad? Paige tilts her head sideways. We're islanders, we don't let the rain stop us. That's what stupid mainlanders do. Hey, language, but that's what you say. That doesn't mean you can say it. I turn around so she doesn't see me grin at having my own words thrown back at me. I peer up at the clouds, again, which don't seem to be moving that fast. Since this is probably going to be our last getaway together for God knows how long, I sure don't want the afternoon to be a disappointment. Okay, 20 minutes. We boot it down the trail, snap a few shots of the cliffs, and then we boot it back. Deal? Deal. She opens the door and hops out. Our car is the only one in the parking lot, which isn't surprising in this weather. Gray autumn skies frame the gnarled trees and towering cedars, bathing them in a pale monochrome light. I zip up Paige's cherry red jacket. Let's do this, she cries, pumping her fist into the air. I laugh. Sure, easy for her to say. Even though I don't think there's a damn thing wrong with getting a bit wet and muddy, her mom sees things differently. I caught hell a few weekends back when she got a cold after we were stuck in a storm. After that, Paige was conveniently napping every time I tried to call her that week. And from then on, I didn't want to give Deborah another excuse to keep her from me. It takes us maybe 10 minutes to walk through the woods to the coastline. Tourists often pick picnic at Oceanside Park because it has that rugged West Coast feel to it. The dark clouds have cl crept closer to shore, but not by much. We have a bit of time. Okay, get snapping. We're not staying here for long. Her camera clicks and whirls as she points it at a log, a twisted tree, a lonely patch of grass sprouting between the rocks, just about everything except the cliffs themselves. A loud crunch snatches my attention. At first, I don't see anything, only the thick grove of cedars we just walked through. But then I get a glimpse of him, a boy, can't be more than 10, and a black hoodie watches us from between the trees. The kid just stares, his hands unmoving by his side. So I wave to him and call out, hey there, you okay? He doesn't move, just keeps staring. I wonder where he came from. I guess he could have walked here, but the nearest house has to be at least a few miles away. More importantly, why the hell is he just watching me like that? A couple drops of rain snap against my shoulder and I realize everything has turned a shade darker. All right, kiddo, we got it. She's nowhere near me. I spot her running toward the mammoth boulders and cliffs that straddle the coast. Her bright red jacket stands out like a fresh wound against a gray rock and my heart quickens. Paige, get back here. I yell, but she just turns and waves at me. Then she takes a few more photos before carefully climbing down the other side of the boulder. Paige, no! I sprint for the rocks, running as hard as I can. Just as I reach the top of the cliff, my left ankle rolls, popping out against a patch of uneven stone. My foot explodes in white hot pain and I hit the ground. I grit my teeth, hauling myself back up. Fortunately, it takes me just a few more hobbling stops to make it to the top. Paige, I scream. Why are you? I don't even feel my ankle anymore. Everything from my rib cage going down is numb. I stumble down the other side of the ridge onto a flat shelf blotched with moss. Again, I peer over the edge, frantically scanning the shoreline. My breathing quickens and every sensory detail becomes razor sharp. It's almost overwhelming. The salty reek of the ocean, the pounding surf, the rapid tapping of rain against my jacket. My ears strain to pick up any sign of page, a giggle, a cry cry for help, anything, but there's only the steady crashing of waves on stone. Paige, I scream again, so loud my voice cracks and turns raspy. 
I grip the side of my head and dig my fingernails into my scalp. This can't be happening. Where the hell is she? The movement at the edge of the forest catches my attention, and it's the boy in the black hoodie again. He stands just at the tree line, but this time he isn't staring at me. His gaze is pointed at the tide pool only a few feet away from the surf's reach. I don't know how I missed it. Floating in the shallow water is Paige's bright pink camera. My stomach twists so tight it turns my legs to rubber. I grip the walk, rock wall with one hand to steady myself, watching it bobbing in that ink black pool. Then it all goes black for a moment. Is it her? Did she hear me fall? The figure kneels down beside me and then leans in closer. Only then can I make out who this is and my heart sinks. The boy from the woods looks down at me with this cold blank expression like a department store mannequin. mannequin. Where is she? It's a little more than a whisper. He doesn't react, doesn't even blink, and then he's gone. Maybe I slipped back into unconsciousness for a few moments, but it was like he just vanished into thin air. Here one second, gone the next. The trees at the edge of the forest are blurry, and I stare hard trying to focus. It takes a minute or two. My legs begin to feel more solid as I come back into consciousness, but my head's still pounding. Paige, where are you? Only winds and wave answer me. It dawns on me that the downpour has stopped. I start walking toward the forest, figuring she might have hid there to get out the weather. After just a few steps, I spot her red coat among the trees. She presses her way out of a patch of cedars cloaked with vines, clumsy, slowly, and then she stops to look at me. Even from a hundred yards away, I can see how wide her eyes are. Paige, I yell, and half jug, half jog, half limp toward her. She screams, a piercing sound that sinks deep inside me. Once I'm closer, I can see her hair is slick against her head and she's soaked. I search her body for wounds, for broken bones or blood, but there's nothing. She seems physically unharmed, yet she's still screaming. A steady unbroken wall that sounds almost mechanical. I take her into my arms, squeezing her tight, telling her everything's okay, but the screaming doesn't stop. I tell her she's safe, everything's fine, but it's like she can't hear me. She's in her own world. I slip off my coat and wrap her in it. She's shivering. Before I can pick her up and carry her back to the car, she pulls away from me, pointing at a cluster of cedar trees she ran out from. There. Her voice is distant, empty. What do you mean? What's there? The boy. And she starts crying again. I take her back into my arms and stare at the forest, at the dark spaces between the trees. Shh, you're safe now. Everything is fine. It's a lie, of course. That hollow look in her eye tells me that everything's anything but all right. That creepy little shit did something to her, maybe said something to her. What happened? What did he do? She didn't answer. Her chest rises and falls against mine in heaving sobs. Part of me wants to charge into the woods and find that little, but I have a wet, cold daughter to think of first. I carry her back to the path and through the woods the same way we came in. The added weight puts even more pressure on my ankle. I grip my teeth against the pain. In 10 minutes, we'll be back at the car. I can get her dry. Paige drapes her arms around my neck and presses her head against my shoulder. It'll be over soon, don't worry, I tell her. The more I think about it and what that little might have done to my daughter, I wanna find him. I decide to take just a few steps down the trail to see if I could spot him somewhere. Maybe catch a glimpse of his hideout so I could tell the cops where to look. I don't know if I got twisted around or what happened, but all of a sudden I'm 50 feet into the woods, surrounded by limp ferns dotted with black spots and a carpet of deep green moss that creeps over rocks and up the fungus spunk speckled trunk of trees. Twisted branches scratch out our face. My heart is slamming against my chest. I worry that my head is all messed up from the fall because I sure as hell don't remember trudging this deep into the forest. I wouldn't have gone this far with Paige, not in this condition. I turn to go back toward the main path when I get the feeling we're being watched. It feels like there's a person hiding in the trees, eyeing our every step. I look up and for a moment I can't breathe. The boy in the black hoodie hangs from a tree limb about a dozen feet off the ground. His empty eye sockets set in putrid white tissue look down at us. His body just twists in the breeze. Jesus, I whisper. My limbs go numb and weak, and I notice my grip on Paige is loosening. 
I try to hold her tighter, my gaze still glued to those hollow eyes and the thick rope squeezing the kid's neck. In that moment, everything goes quiet. All I can hear is Paige breathing, slow and deep. Daddy, she says quietly, we need to go. Okay, kiddo, I turn and start walking. We're going, no, we need to go now. She kicks me hard at the top of the knee and she starts clawing at my face. I let go of her and she runs into the brush, screaming once again. I chase after her. My ankle's on fire, my head is throbbing, but I'm able to gain some ground on her. She's just a few feet away from me, a few feet ahead when we burst out of the trees and into the parking lot. She collapses onto the gravel, sobbing. Shh, it's okay, it's okay. I stare back at the forest, hating myself for ever wandering into it. Paige's breathing is slowed, laced with heavy sighs. Her head rests against my chest. I'm not sure if she's sleeping, but she's not sobbing anymore, which I guess is a good sign. A reason to worry maybe a little less. Yet I do still worry, of course. I can't stop picturing that boy in the woods with his empty sockets like tiny black funnels looking down at us, or the blank expression on his, on his face as he looked down on me as I lay semi-conscious on the rocks. But it can't be the same kid. It just wouldn't make sense. My brain really must be scrambled from hitting my head. Hurts like hell, too. And the pain reminds me that my judgment probably isn't at the best right now. I need to call 911. I need to get Paige checked out by a paramedic, report that body to the police. But I can't remember where I put my damn phone. I pop it open the middle console and feel around the cup holders, doing my best not to disturb Paige in the process. She shifts her weight, and I feel something hard press against my stomach. There's something in her jacket pocket. I reach inside and find her pink camera. It's covered in a skim of dark green slime from the tide pool, but otherwise still seems intact. She must have picked it up after some time after I fell, then took it into the woods. I set it on the dash. I have no time for that right now. I keep rummaging for my phone. Yet, my eyes keep drifting back over to the camera. The thing has a presence about it. It's a weird sort of magnetism that tugs at my attention, pulling my focus away from everything else. I grab the camera, turn the thing on, and hit play. Then I start swiping through the images she took. The log. The twisted tree. The lonely patch of grass sprouting between the rocks. And then a picture of me. I'm laying at the base of the cliff, cliff excuse me, just a few feet from the ocean. For a second, I'm horrified to think Paige would snap a picture of me while I'm unconscious like that. But then I take a closer look at my face. I realize that my eyes are vacant and my head doesn't quite look how a head's supposed to look. The surrounding rocks are speckled with blood. I throw the camera against the windshield. It bounces off the glass, landing on the passenger seat. What the? Everything seems to spin a little. I can taste the saliva thickening in my mouth as my adrenaline spikes. What the hell is happening? Paige murmurs in her sleep. I stroke her hair, squeeze her tight, breathing in the apple scent of her shampoo. Anything to prove to myself that this is still real and that I'm not dreaming in a coma or something equally terrifying. I glance over at the camera. Other than a small crack running down the side, it seems fine. I need a second look at that photo. Maybe the head injury is just messing with my mind. I gently reposition Paige, stretching over her and picked it up again. When I hit the play button, the picture is the same. I'm still laying there at the base of the cliff, unquestionably dead. The camera says that there's one more image to view, one more picture that was taken after I fell. I'm about to swipe over to see the final image, but my finger stops just above the screen and hovers there. Something deep inside me says I don't want to see this photo that I should never see this photo. So I put the camera down again. I kiss my daughter on the forehead. It doesn't really matter. Paige and I are together and the dark clouds are gone. Yeah. Oh, great, great job, Lisa. What a great story. Awesome. Thank I just you. want to uh, say, um, say for Rudy and Hisup, the, uh, the comments, uh, I didn't check the comments, but we got claps and claps and uh cheers for for everyone in the comments section over there um before we before we move on to uh gwendolyn keist i'm going to mention a few things uh the stream is going to remain uh up here on this youtube channel as an archive uh, indefinitely as will all of the six um festival dates you can watch them live um you could watch them live um 
here. Those are the dates. Or at your leisure. Uh, also on this channel are other events, um, uh, the book launch of Underworld Dreams and uh, the Nighttime Logic events that are going to be coming in 2021 will be here on this channel, so you can hit subscribe. Uh, again, the full festival dates. The next one's on December 12th, this Saturday. We have the 14th and the 19th at 7 p.m. We have Sunday the 20th at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we're going to wrap it up Christmas Eve, December 24th. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, thank the three readers here tonight. Thank all the 20 readers uh, who are part of the festival. Um, some of the other content providers, just a quick shout out to. I want to mention again the Outer Dark Podcast, uh, friends of ours. Uh, the What Are You Afraid of podcast and the Ink Heist podcast for good uh, ghostly and horror content. Uh, I want to mention Cemetery Dance Online, a great place to go to get news about everything horror. And if you'd like to support the festival, you can donate via our Ko-fi account, uh, ko-fi.com front slash nighttime logic. Donations go towards our subscription, production, and advertising costs. And if you want to support me, you can check out my latest book, Underworld Dreams, which is out now. And Underworld Dreams and all of my books have ghosts and ghost stories in them. Next up is Gwendolyn Keist and her ghost stories. Um, we're going to hear from some reading from some of our beautiful books here. Um, I just, I'm just really into books that just look cool as an addition to being cool. Um, Gwendolyn Keist is the Bram Stoker Award winning author of The Rust Maidens from Trepidatio Publishing. And her smile will untether the universe, her short story collection from Journal Stone, the dark fantasy novella I just showed you, Pretty Mary's All in a Row from Broken Eye Books and the occult par novelette, which I just showed you, The Invention of Ghosts, which is a little illustrated uh, chapbook from Nightscape Press. Her short fiction and nonfiction have appeared in Nightmare Magazine, The Starian, Tours, Nightfire, Black Static, Daily Science Fiction, Unnerving, Interzone, and Lamplight, among others. Originally from Ohio, she now resides in an abandoned horse farm outside of Pittsburgh with her husband, two cats, and not nearly enough ghosts. How are you doing, Gwendolyn? <laughs> just fine. That's right. There's ghosts you can mention in my bio. That, that wasn't even just for <laughs> that, this. That That's abandoned just like the isn't abandoned right, isn't abandoned right now. Uh, uh, <laughs> you're inviting yeah. you're inviting those ghosts. So what's what's the appeal of ghost stories? to you or what's the appeal of ghosts to you as a person and or as a reader? I I just love, I love what they're like, but like symbolically, I think ghosts are so interesting symbolically. They, they symbolize the past. They can symbolize our fears. They can take on so many different aspects of, of human nature. And so to me, and plus, you know, the ghost stories are sort of like the original horror stories. You know, they're the ones that go back, you know, Forever, I don't even know. Like, is there the first ghost story? Do we even know what that was? I I don't know. I I just find that they're they're so timeless, and I love that you have ghost stories from all different eras. I always love going back to some of the Victorian ghost stories from like, you know, Edith Wharton, and then you can go through you know all the 20th century, and there's just every era has its own ghost story. So I just think it's it's a great way to track horror, and it's something that we all we all share is this kind of like interest or fear or skepticism about ghosts. I feel like everyone has an opinion on ghosts. Yeah, it, I wonder what bad. the first, I bet somebody's got to know, or there's some, some, some scholarly person has pronounced it the first ghost story. I mean, maybe I want this, this is the first oh, that? <laughs> I mean, this is the first known right. ghost story. It's Somebody's got to know that. Right? Yeah, I don't, I don't um, you know, but uh, I used to think it was a Christmas Carol um, by Dickens, but I know that that is simply not true. That might be one of the, the more well-known ones. And yeah, I think I think ghost stories are a great way yeah. to track us, to track to track you. You meant um, mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, Rudy and Hissop mentioned um, history in different periods as well, and 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 you touched on that. And and ultimately, these ghost stories mm -hmm. are. Our story, our stories of us, um, and their way of telling their way of telling um, human stories. Um, in your story recommendations, I and when we're preparing for this, I asked you about a couple of your favorites, and 
Um, two of them I'll throw at you. You mentioned Shirley Jackson and EF Benson as uh, among your favorites. Um, what what tell us a little bit about those and and why those um, mean something to you? The Shirley Jackson one is obviously Haunting of Hill House. I'm sure she has other ghost stories, but I feel like that that's the one that everybody knows as being, you know, Shirley Jackson's major ghost story. And I just, I love her prose. I love her use of character. I love the setting. I think everything about Haunting of Hill House works so well, just like most of Shirley Jackson's work works so incredibly well. And then the other story was how Fear Departed from the Long Gallery, which is a an older, I think kind of Victorian era ghost story and it was one that my parents both love and they they told me about when i was a kid so i just have like this kind of nostalgic love for it and it's, it's got some really great uses of of ghostly tropes maybe even before they were as much of tropes as they are now but they're it's a really great very classic ghost story and it's got like a nice little twist in there that, that's kind of fun and almost kind of sweet even though it's a very creepy story in parts of it so it's got like a great kind of combination of all the things i personally love about ghost stories I mean, um, yeah, it's cool that you mentioned that we're hearing um, we're hearing ghost stories from different periods of time. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to give some remarks on ghost stories, and I'm like, oh, I'll just give this chronology of the ghost story and how it changed. And I'm like, wow, that's like a treatise. That's like a PhD statement. But it's really amazing just how serendipi ser serendipitously um, all the 20 authors, they just naturally fanned out. And it became it's become a natural exploration of it. I mean, uh, uh, you and Hisab are going to be you know uh, reading new ones. Rudy gave us a classic one. We're getting to talk mm -hmm. about um, the classic ones, and uh, that's why um it's great to have have you as part of the festival, Gwendolyn. As like you you mentioned tropes, and we we as readers and we in, as writers. Right, we love tropes. Like we love the ghost story. Right, like to me, there's nothing mm -hmm. as great as a ghost story that goes down just the way you expect it and just the way you like it, except for a ghost story that goes down in a way that surprises you. And like, I didn't think of that. <laughs> so um, before we talk about your stories, a guy, your other story that you mentioned and, mm -hmm. and uh, everyone seemed to kind of be the zeitgeist of Ray Bradbury tonight. Um, one of the stories that Hissa picked up had been compared to Bradbury. Uh, Rudy mentioned a Martian Chronicle story, and you mentioned you mentioned the Lake by Ray Bradbury, and that was first published in Weird Tales magazine in 1944. And it seems like a classic now; it is a classic. But I was just reading in my copy of the October Country um, in Bradbury's introduction, and he was talking about how um, the editors were like writing to him, like, "Yeah, we'll publish this, but can you give us something more traditional?" You know, like at, at the time, um, uh, it was pretty groundbreaking. And like, like I think stories like The Lake weren't weren't being published, and it's so interesting to me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I'm I'm a newcomer to Ray Bradbury in the last few years. Um, you were one of the authors um, who got me to read Bradbury. I know you had I, I've always seen you talking about the October Country, and The Lake is um, The Lake is a standout story. Um, in a book full of standouts. I, mm -hmm. I know I'm rambling a lot about it, but I have a question at the end of the ramble here. And I can only imagine the reaction of like what people were thinking when the story came out all those mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. um, it's very different than the ghost stories, these classics. It's sort of part of this new era or a changing mm -hmm. era of both fiction and ghost mm -hmm. stories. And mm -hmm. it's wistful, it's full of longing, full of feelings of things lost in childhood. Mm -hmm. And all that's expressed in this, the narrator's longing for the lost character, Tally. And the ending, it has a note um, that when Tally comes back or is given back to the narrator, there's a feeling that he winds up estranged from his wife. And there's all sorts of water imagery and carnival imagery in Bradbury. What, what stands out to you and makes The Lake one of your favorite uh, Bradbury stories? I think it's like you said, it's it's the longing of it. It 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 isn't this like, oh, the ghost is gonna come and get you, you know, a lot of which that's great too. Honestly, I love those type of stories too. But I think what really struck me about the lake was how much it was really about 
that sense of longing and that sense of loss. Again, one of the things that really appeals to me about ghost stories is, is the sense of loss and is the sense of the past and how much is contained in the past with our fear of ghosts and also our desire for ghosts, like our, our wanting to meet ghosts and, and see the people that we love and know that they're okay. And that's a lot of what the lake is about and it's done so poignantly and so beautifully and it's so devastating. And to me, it's like, it's such an example of, of a horror story that isn't necessarily scary. That isn't like, oh, I'm going to, you know, jump out and give you a jump scare, but it's still very much horror, but it's, it's got that very strong emotional core to it. And like you said, I think before that, there weren't as many stories necessarily like that. They were kind of more that traditional, let's really be creepy. Let's really kind of go in that, that kind of dark direction. And this really wasn't that, even though it's very dark at points and it's very sad. So I, I do, I think it's that longing that really makes it stand out to me. Yeah, it's amazing how um, yeah you mentioned the appeal, the ghost story to you is the symbolism. And it's great because, yeah, it's such a great story because, yeah, there's there's symbolism, there's metaphor going on there. And what was either, um, what was masterful about Bradbury's, it doesn't line up one-to-one. -one. I feel like when that symbolism lines up, like the ghost is really his childhood. The ghost is really his wish to be an airline pilot. Like it, that <laughs> loses some of the power, but you know what I am. Um, but um, with Bradbury, you're still, you know that it's, you know that there's metaphor happening. You know that there's mm -hmm. symbolism happening and you don't quite get what. And I feel like that's, um, that's a story that's the, what I call the nighttime part of the story, the nighttime logic uh, part mm -hmm. of the story, which is the namesake of the series. It's that part of the story that's felt and not direct, we're not directly processing the lake with the conscious level, even though the story, the story works on mm -hmm. a present mm -hmm. level. There's, um, there's that other part of the story that we're processing, that we're feeling. What's what's the importance of that aspect of storytelling and ghost stories for you? You know, I think so much of ghosts aren't something that we can really completely understand anyhow. Like there is a kind of sense of the ephemeral or the ethereal in ghosts because they aren't something we can touch. I mean, every once in a while a ghost story, you can touch a ghost, but most of the time you can't. And it is this idea of something that's not quite solid. And so I think when the metaphor has that kind of, you know, permeable quality, it, it, it's interesting because it, it very much plays off this idea of how we feel about ghosts and our relationship as human beings to ghosts. So I, I do like that that's something that Bradbury really uses here and, and really does explore these kind of longing and this kind of nostalgia and this sense of loss, which all are things that we can't really touch. You can't touch nostalgia. It's it's not a it's not a thing you can hold, but you can understand it. And most people can understand it, just like most time, most of the time we can understand ghosts. And so I feel like there's really a, a kind of one to one there, even though you know it's it's not a direct relationship. We can see it and we can understand it. I just noticed as I had your you on solo there, um, I noticed the pumpkin painting in the background of your thing. And as as Yusuf and Rudy were were reading, I was playing the the streaming game of like, can I can I see what can I see what books are on their shelf there? I was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I was looking looking for the books to, in in your. I'm like, oh, we got the pumpkin, the very October country bidding there. But um, you've written some exceptional ghost stories. Um, one of them is uh, Pretty Mary's All in a Row. Uh, can you tell us um, maybe about the urban legend that you play with in Pretty Mary's um, and what, you know, what it might have been based on there? Yeah, absolutely. So Pretty Mary's All in a Row is about the five of the Marys from folklore. So Resurrection Mary, Mary Mack, Mistress Mary Quite Contrary, um, oh, Bloody Mary. And Mary Lloyd, who's perfect for this time of year because she's like a Welsh tradition that's like a hobby horse with a horse skull that people used to take around wassailing, which is really wonderfully bizarre and, and I guess festive. So one of the things that when I went to write the story is I had realized that there were a lot of different Marys either in folklore or some of those were nursery rhymes. And and it was interesting to me, this, this connection through all of these different kind of ghost stories or or you know, again, nursery rhymes or folklore. And I thought, what if all of these Marys were actually ghosts who were existing together? And so Pretty Marys on the Road, it's all the Marys, it's these five Marys that are 
basically forced together and they don't really know why and they're trying to figure it out and that's really they're you know trying to understand why are we this legend why are we ghosts and trying to figure out their role and all of that and that's such a it's just such an interesting for those of us who love ghost stories it's just such a great um just a great addition to the lineage um before we hear you read from that uh the other story you're going to be reading from is the invention of ghosts and um, I found that the invention of ghosts has all the hallmark of your work of a Gwendolyn Kai story. It has characters who are outsiders. It has persons who may not fit into the mainstream, but it also has some really unique ghosts. I'm not sure if you want to answer this or not, or if you're going to hit on it in the reading, but can you tell us about some of the unique aspects or the unique aspect that your ghosts in that story have and what makes them different between ghosts we've previously previously seen because um yeah I think people people should know about that. It's like really, really fantastic element of your story there. <sighs> Ah, uh, let's see, do I want to spoil it? I guess I'll just say spoiler alert. If you haven't read The Invention of Ghosts yet, I'm going to give a spoiler. It, it, the big part of the ghosts in this is that it's not necessary that you have to die to become a ghost. So the metaphor there is just this idea that many of us can feel kind of ghostly in our own lives and sort of like we're walking through our own lives or we're getting lost in our own life, or our own existence, or to the people that we care about. So there is a character that actually becomes a ghost, not necessarily because she's died, but because she's feeling like she's starting to become sort of invisible. And, and I feel like that's probably been done before. I feel like I, I've kind of seen a little like that, but I've, I really wanted to take it with this kind of friendship between these two girls and, you know, how friendship can go sour and how devastating, you know, a loss of a relationship can be and how that can kind of make you you know, feel that loss in a way that can feel almost like you're a ghost or that the relationship is a ghost. So I feel like that isn't giving away too much, but. <laughs> Fantastic. Which uh, you're going to read a bit from both of them. Which one do you want to read from first? I think let's start with, with that one. Let's start with The Invention of Ghosts. All right. Here's Gwendolyn Kais reading from The Invention of Ghosts. So this came out earlier this year, which seemed, it came out in January, which seems like a million years ago at this point. I don't feel like January even exists at this point, but it did. And this book came out from Nightscape Press from part of their uh, charitable chat book series. And all uh, like a third of the proceeds from all of these books from this series go to uh, charity. And mine went to the National Aviary in Pittsburgh because I love, go I, I love ghosts and I love birds. So, and in my latest book, I even have ghost birds. So it's like combining my two favorites. But so we're just going to start at the beginning of Invention of Ghosts. And I'm going to read a little bit from that. The wrapping in the ceiling came to us in September. It was Saturday night and we were spinning hand-me-down records in our dorm room. Iggy Pop and Susie Sue and Donovan's season of The Witch, even though we both agreed that last one was a bit too on the nose. What kind of witch do you want to be, Everly? You asked me, giggling. Whatever which has the most power, I said, and tried to twitch my nose. We danced around the room together, all flailing arms and missteps, our weekend ritual of too loud music and cold pizza left out to congeal and cardboard. By then, we'd already been friends for years. I was sure of that much, though it was the only thing I knew. I couldn't remember the day we met. We must have been kids together once, you and me, strange and bullied and promising ourselves we'd get out of that small town hell. But when I closed my eyes, I didn't remember any of that. All I saw were shadows, where memories should be. Out in the hall, bodies moved back and forth, a holler here, a cat call there, nearly drowning out our songs. Every weekend, the other students went free range, wandering and carousing through the dorm, their sweat smelling like whiskey and hormones. A figure lingered right outside, wavering there like it was eager to come in. We held our breath. In the evening, we never opened our door, not even if someone knocked. You and I were only safe together, away from the world. It's locked, right? You whispered, and I nodded. With a scowl, you shoved a chair under the doorknob just to be sure. Wish everyone would leave us alone. Not everyone, I sprawled out on the floor, half dizzy from dancing. I wouldn't mind sharing our room with a ghost or two. You switched out the record, superstition for lust for life, and dropped the needle in the groove. And what about people who aren't like you? What if someone doesn't want a ghost to stick around? I laughed. I guess that's what exorcists are for. You didn't usually ask me about spirits, even though they were my favorite topic. I was a history major with a focus on the unknown. 
All those Victorian mystics and mesmerists and spiritualists who conjured Houdini in parlors. Yuri Geller with his spoons and Mother Shipton with her visions. I wanted it all. I wanted their secrets. You weren't so sure yourself. The way you keep diving into the dark, you'd say. Someday you might get lost there. I just shrug. There are worse places to go. You didn't, you didn't know yet who you were going to be. The word undecided printed in bold accusing letters at the top of your class schedule. Don't worry, I would tell you at night when you couldn't sleep. You'll figure it out. You turned to me, your eyes flashing in the dark. Promise? I promise. The speakers crackled and still slouched on the floor, I spread out a row of vintage postcards I bought off eBay. Victorian figures posed in fancy parlors, their faces twisted, pale ectoplasm blossoming from their mouths, long strings of it stretching up into the air. You sat cross-legged next to me. Are any of these real? I shook my head. It was all just a hoax they used back in the 1800s to sell postcards. Yet even in the frauds, there was something to learn, why people did it and why others believed. You put your hand over your own mouth as if that might stifle ectoplasm from growing there. What's it made of? All different things, I said, gnawing my bottom lip. Heavy cream and cheesecloth, chewed up paper, whatever they could find that looked the eeriest. We huddled together, the contorted faces and the pictures staring back at us. I moved closer, and something in the images shimmered, just for a moment, just long enough for me to reach out, ready to awaken them, ready to draw out their magic. But you got to them first. One by one, right down the line, you turned over all the postcards. No more tonight, you said, shivering. I'd upset you. I was always upsetting you. I'm sorry, my stomach stitched into knots. It wasn't supposed to scare you. You waved me off with one hand. I'm fine, you said, and crossed to the dresser. As you changed into your flannel pajamas, your back to me, I quietly flipped over the last picture. The face there was sullen and still. No movement, nothing at all. The record ended and the turntable emitting a blank static. And we climbed into our beds without speaking again. You were out in a minute, but I couldn't sleep. Couldn't stop thinking about those pictures. Something was wrong with them. Or maybe something was wrong with me. That would explain it why my entire life had escaped me. I'd misplaced who I was, easy as forgetting where I put my house keys. Across the room, you murmured in your sleep and I wanted to ask you about it, about everything, who we were, where we'd been, but it found me first. A single wrapping right above us. Bodies still pushed back and forth in the hallway outside our door, but it couldn't be another party overhead. You and I lived on the top floor. Another knock in the ceiling and you bolted awake in your bed. What was that? Your face pale as the moon. Is something here with us? The room went silent again, but your fear was already rising all around us, suffocating the air from our lungs, and I curled my body tighter in, in my bed, just desperate to keep you calm. I'm sure it's nothing, I said, and closed my eyes. But I couldn't stop thinking about the wrapping. Probably just a rat, I told myself, building a nest in the plaster. That made sense. It was also wrong, and I knew it. Plus, there were the postcards. Three or four times a day, I took out the stack from under my mattress where I'd hidden the images away so they wouldn't bother you. But no matter how long I looked at them, the faces never moved again. Maybe I'd imagined all this. Maybe I'd envisioned ghosts where there were only shadows. I needed to find out for sure. You came home early from class and discovered me at my desk. I never heard the door open. Instead, there you were, suddenly looming over me, staring down at a black and white photograph of the Fox sisters. The founders of the spiritualist movement, I said, even though you didn't ask. They claimed they could communicate with ghosts. You touched their faces one by one. What happened to them? Nothing good. My fingers curled against the edge of the book. They did their performances all over, found success, even got married. Then it all fell apart. Why, you asked, your voice far away as if you were speaking from a dream. Because they turned on each other. Your gaze flicked up at me. But they were sisters. It didn't matter, I said, and turned to the next page. Take a photograph with me, I said one morning, just before Halloween. What will we wear, you asked, brightening, and I smiled. I'd enrolled in a photography class to learn about tintypes, the closest thing I could get to the old-time spirit photography. The theater department let me borrow two Victorian morning dresses for the afternoon, and in the basement of our dorm, I'd set up a background with a red velvet curtain and two stools draped in lace, all for our own memento mori. Are we supposed to be like them? You asked when I showed you the pictures in my book, the ones with families flanking well-dressed relatives in caskets. Are we supposed to be dead? 
Only if you want us to be. I laughed, and you laughed too, though something in you shifted. Your mouth a rigid line, you stared off at the wall, scratching at your heavy lace collar. Ever since the wrapping in the ceiling, you couldn't sleep. Sometimes I woke up at night, and there you'd be in the next bed, your eyes colorless and distant, peering into the darkness above us. I'd always ask you what was wrong, but you never answered. I inhaled the basement mildew, regret seeping into me. If you'd rather not do the picture, it's fine, you said, and took a seat on the temporary set. I should have argued with you. I should have called the whole thing off. But you glanced at me again and smiled. Are we doing this or what? I set up the camera on a timer and joined you, both of us silent and waiting until the flash went off. There was another reason I wanted the portrait. At the start of the semester, I'd gone through all my dresser drawers and the desk and even my phone. There were no pictures anywhere. Not of me or you or anyone else. My past wiped clean. But maybe it was a good thing. People talk about second chances, clean slates. Now I had mine, an opportunity to rebuild a life, one image at a time. In the dark room that night, the photo came back different than I expected. Convinced I'd rigged the timer wrong, I'd moved toward the camera at the last moment and my figure blurred out, a smear of shadows where my eyes and mouth should be. And there you were next to me, unmoving, your face wan, everything about you in startlingly sharp focus. Sometimes though, if I stared at us long enough, we would switch. I'd become the one in focus and you would blur out. I never showed you the picture. Instead, I shoved it to the back of my desk drawer and put thick folders and books on top of it. Anything to hide it away. Anything to keep you from being afraid. It was the end of November when I couldn't staunch your fear any longer. We were in the crowded cafeteria together at a corner table, our tray set in front of us, though neither of us was hungry. The wrapping had returned two weeks before. And while I held fast to the rat theory, you weren't convinced. What if it's something else you kept asking every night in the dark? It'll be okay, I promised you. Now you sat with me, not speaking, not even when I asked you what was wrong. Please talk to me, I said, but my voice was gobbled up in the din of impatient students waiting in line for lunch. Someone hollered nearby and backed against our table, nearly knocking my tray to the ground. There were people everywhere, faces I didn't recognize. This whole place felt unfamiliar. Even when I glanced at you, you looked like a stranger too. I gripped my spoon tighter, desperate to finish the rest of my coleslaw and get back to the room, back to safety. My hands quivered, the skin burning to the bone so hot I couldn't bear it. Everything in me burned bright and I wanted to scream out. Then it was over in an instant. The metal utensil turned liquid between my fingers and curled up like a fortune-telling fish. I made no sound when it happened. I didn't even breathe. I just hunched over a little and stared at it, a perfect silver spiral in the palm of my hand, a bent spoon. This was my fault, something I'd done wrong, something I'd conjured into being. My heart clutched tight, I turned to you, but you pretended not to see it, even though you knew, even though your eyes darkened across the table and you wouldn't look at me the rest of the day. I wanted to tell you it was nothing, only a silly trick I'd probably never be able to do again, no reason to blame me. After all, I was still your best friend if I was still your best friend. Be careful, you said that night before you turned out the lights and I didn't know if it was a warning for me or for, for you. We didn't talk about what happened in the cafeteria. You seemed happier that way. I don't want anything to come between us, you said. So I never told you about how I fell asleep in English composition on a Monday morning and by the time I woke up, my desk had levitated half a foot off the floor. She's the one. I heard the others whisper in the hallway, but when you asked what they meant, I just shrugged and pretended not to understand. The semester ended and with it came that long, strange stretch between fall and spring when everyone fled home for Christmas. Suitcases stuffed with dirty laundry lined the hallway and the other students chortled, chortled and chattered and hugged goodbye, their bus stubs or plane tickets in hand. You and I were from the same town. If I focused hard enough, I could almost imagine the outline of your house. But you didn't want to go back there. Stay here with me, you said. And because I didn't want to leave you alone, I agreed. Overnight, the campus became a haunted, empty place. No classes, no open cafeteria, just the two of us marooned together with a quart of aristocrat vodka and a dozen packages of peanut butter sandwich crackers we'd emptied out of the vending machine. We'd eaten When we'd eaten everything in the dorm, our, our quarters could buy us. We walked down the block in the sub-zero weather to the 7-Eleven, our arms looped together. And with our last two dollars, we picked out two cans of Campbell's chicken noodle soup. Back in our room with no microwave, we giggled and ate the soup cold, slurping every drop out with plastic sporks. 
I wish it could always be this way, you said. I smiled. So do I. This was okay. We were all right again, you and me. No more fear crackling behind your eyes. No glancing away from me because of what you'd seen, what I'd done. After our makeshift dinner, you tethered the empty soup cans together with your boot laces and strung them between our beds. My own homespun magic, you said with a grin. All night we colluded in the dark. Our secrets passed back and forth along that single taut string. There was a world in those shadows that no one else could ever touch. Did we do this when we were kids? I whispered. Don't you remember? You asked, your voice warbling inside the ribbed metal as though you were a thousand miles away. I didn't answer. Instead, I turned over in bed, still clutching the tin can, as your distant whispers lulled me to sleep. I think I'm going to stop there with this one. And now I'm going to read a little bit from Pretty Mary's All in a Row. There are more ghosts as this goes along. I feel like that's more of a thing as it goes along. I feel like that wasn't super ghostly, though there were mentions of ghosts. But so yep, you set up, you set up the <laughs> What was that? Yeah, you set up the relationships and you told us about uh, that ghostly element. And now we're going to hear a bit from Pretty Mary's All in a Row. <laughs> So this is a novella that came out from Broken Eye Books in 2017 now, I think, which seems like a very long time ago. Like I said, January seems like forever ago now. So, chapter one. The two college kids scream, and the sound fills my ears like sweet music. The melody ricochets off the slick leather interior, and the baby-faced driver gapes at the rearview mirror, gapes at me, the ghost in their midst. His gaze anywhere but the road, he looks ready to twist the wheel and thrust us straight into the nearest tree. Personally, I wouldn't care if we did crash, so it would certainly break up the monotony of the evening, but it's liable to make a terrible mess for these two. Twisted metal and twisted bones. Ugly stuff. Fortunately for them, he only quivers and keeps screaming and presses harder on the gas pedal as if that would be enough to outrun me, as if I'm not a passenger too. In the shadows of the back seat, his goateed pal crawls a against the door and claws at the lock, his eyes covered with one hand, his mouth drooping open, a deep and bottomless well. He wanted a make-out session, but I guess I've never kissed quite the way the boys like. The air glints with their screams, a gray smoke only I can see. Smiling, I part my lips and quaff their fear like fine wine. And I was worried tonight would be boring. Haunting is an imperfect science, after all, and this pair of stragglers was the best I could do. Clueless fools out for a weekend joyride in daddy's borrowed Lexus. But they're better than I expected, the tune of their terror brimming with the elegance of Glenn Miller, the wink and nudge charm of Frank Sinatra, the indelible class of Bobby Darren. They taste of bygone summer evenings and peach cake with a dollop of whipped cream on top, so sweet it makes my teeth ache. Thank you, I say, and turn toward the darkness. I don't need them to stop the car, which is good since they're still screaming and wouldn't hear my request even if I hollered it. To escape, I simply close my eyes and the sharp crack of night whips around me. When I look again, the hapless boys are gone, their car vanished around the bend, and I'm alone. The highway, my forever companion, is a trimming of black satin before me, and I stand perfectly still at the center of it, the soles of my heels resting on the solid yellow lines. I should go home now. I've gotten what I came for, but I'm still restless, and I'm still hungry. The constellations wink above me and I start walking. There are no houses here, only a narrow shoulder and a ribbon of potholed asphalt no one's bothered to repair in 20 years. Overhead, the spruce trees huddle together and sap drips from the cusps of the branches like fresh tears. It must be spring now, though I can't be sure. Ghosts have no way of telling time, no tally marks etched in the woodwork to track our days. There are no appointments to keep except to be here on this highway to meet the darkness when it calls. And that could happen any night of any season. I hesitate and tip my head back to the sky. A cab of so-called men buzzed with whiskey and sodas coming my way. My mouth waters and each of my fingers curves into talons. Even from a quarter mile off, they blister through my blood. There'll be such easy pickings. The best, one, the best are the ones who never see it coming. And why would they see it coming? Here I am, smiling in the gloom, arrayed in satin and pearls, as fancy as a daydream at midnight. It's a flawless disguise. The pickup truck rounds the bend and I nearly levitate off the ground with excitement. Hey baby, sing songs one of them, a greasy fellow half hanging out the backseat window. How much? Too much, I want to reply, but their wolf whistles and deep-throated cackles would drown out anything I have to say. They aren't what I hoped for. Up close, they taste of ash and iron, so I turn away and let them pass, and I don't look back. There's no point. What's behind is gone, and what's gone is as good as dead. 
Not that anything, even the past, is as dead as me. Still, it's a pity they didn't stop. Those drunken dupes long for an unforgettable night, and that's exactly what I can offer. Of course, I could catch up with them if I liked. I drift back toward them, ready to materialize in the bed of their truck. That would really get them me taking over what's theirs. But behind me, someone else stops. A dinged-up red station wagon with a frill of rust around the bumper. My heart quickens, and I clasp my fingers in front of me. A ladylike flourish, but it's only to keep my hands from shaking. The passenger door flicks open, and the console light illuminates a familiar face. Hi, Ree. David smiles at me. Need a ride? Always, I think. But I say nothing. He shouldn't be here. He should be at home, away from ghosts and lonely highways, and I should wait on the road for a more suitable driver, someone I'll be eager to terrorize. I gulp down a heavy breath, ready to tell him to go, but David smiles again, and I know it's hopeless to argue. Hands still quivering, I slide into the passenger seat. It's not slick leather like the college boy's car. The upholstery is stained and worn as an old burlap sack. A sea of matchbooks decorates the interior, the small folded covers in neon and pastel and bold colors, the stench of sulfur lingering lightly on the air. I laugh to myself. David doesn't even smoke and never has, but he collects these souvenirs everywhere he goes, which isn't many places. A seedy bar at the county line or an old Italian restaurant downtown, any nostalgic locale that still believes in smoking jackets and smoke-filled rooms and Ben Patel's always in need of a light. As I settle in for the ride, the matchbook should crinkle beneath me, but I weigh less than air, so the detritus never notices I'm here. But David notices. With a steady hand, he reaches over and closes the door. Where to, he asks, but he already knows. We've got three miles ahead of us. No more, no less. The highway smears past the windows, briars and weeping trees and abandoned storage sheds, all meaningless ink blots in the night. David's fingers curl around the wheel and he glances over at me in the darkness. It's been a while, he says. I wonder how long a while is, but tonight I'd rather not ask. How are you and your sisters? I hold in a rueful laugh. They're not my sisters, not really, though I don't correct him. We're the same as always, I say, not looking at him. And how are you? He hesitates. All right, he says, but the tremor at the end of his voice tells the truth. That's one thing David and I share. Home isn't always where you want to be. I don't know much about his life away from this road, except for the collage of crooked pictures affixed to his dashboard with strips of yellowed tape. He doesn't glance at them much, so neither do I. I try to pretend that there is nothing else. It's just me and him and the highway. We've taken this path, we've taken this path together a thousand times. Every trip is different. Some evenings he tells me jokes, silly wordplay that makes me laugh. Some evenings he describes the waking world beyond here. It almost makes me grateful I'm dead. Some evenings we say nothing. We sit back and retread the same stretch of road, listening to the whir of the asphalt beneath us as if it's the sweetest lullaby. Some evenings he doesn't come at all. And that's okay. It's not always, I'm not always here either. He doesn't know when I'll appear and I don't know when he will. That makes nights like this even better. The rusted spires of the fence emerge in the distance and my throat tightens with disappointment. That metal border is as far as I can go. Tonight's ride is over. It never lasts as long as I hope. David guides the car to the shoulder and the engine cuts out. I gaze at the sign that hangs over us, Resurrection Cemetery. They say this is my final resting place. I'm not so sure. I paced up and down the green manicured rows a hundred times around crooked obelisks and between crumbling mausoleums. I've never found a tombstone that looks like mine. Not that I remember my own name anymore, but I'm confident if I saw it again, I'd recognize it like an old friend. In the meantime, Resurrection Mary is as good as any other moniker. At least it's got a pleasing rhythm to it. Of course, it's not as pleasing as Ree, but not everybody knows my nickname. I wouldn't even want them to. From far away, my home pulls at me, drawing me back to where I belong, not the highway and not the grave, but somewhere claustrophobic and confining and worse. I steady my hands in my lap and do my best to ignore the gentle call of my sisters. I'm not ready. I haven't even taken my evening stroll through the cemetery yet. David exits the car and comes around to my door to open it. I don't need his assistance. I can slip through anything at will. But he's always doing his best imitation of a gentleman. And with my candy sweet smiles and tailored satin, I'm doing my best imitation of a lady. Outside, the moonlight blurs his face, and for a moment he looks the same as the night we met, back when he was an 18-year-old out hot riding for the weekend, and I was the same ghost, looking for a ride. You okay? He tips up his chin, and the years return. The shadows reveal the deep grooves around his eyes, and the sunspots speckling his cheeks. Peaks and valleys, the topography of a life. He ages, but I do not, and we both envy the other for it. I step out of the car and he reaches for my hand, but his fingers slip clean through me. This should be no surprise to either of us, but we're fools to the marrow. There's always an instant we both believe this time will be different. 
This time he'll reach out and I'll be there whole and real, not a ghost, but a girl as common as dust. And together we'll leave this place behind for good and all. But I never change. And somehow our shared sliver of hope makes it all, makes it all so much worse. He smiles at me, a beaten expression that twists like barbed wire in my chest. I can't bear any of this, the charade of it all. Before I can stop myself, I ask the one question I should keep to myself. How's your wife? His face goes gray and he steps back as if I spit fire at him. She's fine, he says at last. And your daughter? I glance at the dashboard and the pocket-sized photograph taped haphazardly to the space closest to the steering wheel, closest to his heart. There she is with that cherubic face, all ruddy cheeks and sprightly calyx. She looks like his wife. She looks a little like me, too. Abby's well, he says. The breeze turns cold and we linger together at the edge of the cemetery fence. Remorse blossoms in my belly like cancer. I shouldn't have asked. This would have been a nice night if I hadn't asked. But sometimes speaking it aloud is the only way we, we remember what's true. My feet heavy as granite, I pace through the gates of the cemetery. David follows. Out in the late night nip of spring, we wander in silence between the headstones. The tug of my home becomes an all-out pull, and I know I can't resist it much longer. I want a choice in where I go, and when, but that's not how this works. David must recognize the look on my face, the defeat drifting behind my eyes, because he shoves his hands in his pockets as if to say goodbye. Great to see you, Ray, he says. It's always great to see you. I inhale and taste the air between us as potent as bitter and bitter as heartbreak. You too, I say. With his head down, David shuffles back to the car. I wait until the engine rumbles to life and he disappears around the corner. Then I close my eyes. All alone, my body rises up and collapses in on itself like the paper folds of an origami lotus. The concrete and cemetery fall away and I dissolve a sugar cube in hot tea. For an instant, I'm trapped between the highway and home, the here and there, in a darkness that's all encompassing. I'm completely lost, completely gone, even less than the ghost I usually am. I should be afraid of this part, but instead I float in the ether, nearly slumbering in my calm. This is the only moment I ever feel truly alone or truly safe. There's nothing here, which means there's nothing to hurt me. I wonder if this is what death feels like. It must be nice to rest and never worry about haunting or family or boys that grow old while you stay young. It must be nice for nothing to matter. But tonight, not even the darkness offers comfort. My breath catches and I realize I shouldn't have given thanks for being alone because for once I'm not. Something draws closer to me, a hazy outline that's almost iridescent in the shadows. It twists and gleams, and its presence is cold, even colder than the dead. And that's something I'm an expert in. I can't see a face, but a voice boils like blood in my ears. Pretty Mary. Pretty, pretty Mary. Every muscle in my body returns to me, no longer dissolved into nothing. I'm liquid and free-flowing, flying and falling all in the same moment. My lips struggle to form the syllables for hello or who are you or what do you want, but no sound comes out. I'm voiceless and empty and paralyzed in the presence of this invader. I want to scream, but I don't have time. As effortlessly as it descended, the voice is gone, evaporating like some rain on concrete, and I'm alone on the steps of a house I wish I didn't recognize. Welcome home, back to my very own prison. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Claps to that. So um, we're going to get ready to wrap up in just a minute. Um, I want to say thank you to Gwendolyn, Rudy, and Hissa. Thank you so much for being the first readers of the first night of the first year of the festival. Thank you so much. I enjoyed all of your readings. Um, if, I, if you three could stay in the studio, um, I'm going to end the broadcast after the video and after the closing card. But if you would just stick around for a minute or two, um, instead of just leaving the studio, uh, we'll talk, a chance to talk off the air. Um, people are clapping and saying thank you to you in the um, comments. I see... Um, we have, uh, it looks like we have Lee, Lee Thomas uh, is with us and John Foster is with us or was with us. Um, if everyone um, is free to come back this Saturday, December 12th at 7 p.m., our guests will be Lee Thomas, Sarah Langan, and Douglas Wynn. We're going to continue on with more ghost stories. We hope to see you there. So, um, and on Christmas Eve, John Foster, uh, the 24th, is going to be uh, one of our Christmas Eve readers. So thank you again for everyone who came. Thank you to the fantastic guests tonight. Stay warm, stay safe, stay inspired, um, and uh, stick around to the guests and have a great night. Well, I'm going to play our closing.
video. Bye. Bye.